That was pretty amazing. Diane, go Diane. Yeah. Well, I want to start also by saying that it's really an honor to be here on this panel roundtable with Fred Ho and also with amazing organizer, you know, Eric Mann and an amazing scholar, activist, Robin Kelly. And I also have so much respect for this audience because I know so many people in this audience are activists and really struggling with how we create change and how we, you know, create a new society, things that I'm very deeply struggling with. Um, I first heard Fred Ho in 1990 at the Asian American Studies Conference at UC Santa Barbara before I got there and just blew me away with your saxophone playing. But I remember, I don't remember when I meet many people in my lives, things sort of flow in and out, but I remember very distinctively when I met Fred Ho, not only because of who he is, but because of what was happening at that time. So it was 1998 at UCLA at an Asian American movement conference, and there haven't been very many of these. And the next day in LA was the Asian Left Forum, the formation of that group. Um, we met in 1998, and we saw each other three times, though he, you live in New York and I live in Santa Barbara, at Jericho, the um, formation of Jericho for political prisoners in Washington, D.C., and at the uh, Critical Resistance Conference to start the prison abolitionist movement, well, the, the current contemporary um, formation of that at Berkeley. And so this was a period in which there was really a lot of hope and vibrancy around new formations and, and work that was happening that I think really got stopped in a very powerful way on 911 and the kinds of organizing that continued. I, I was with a group Asian that was getting out very quietly on Santa Barbara's campus trying to tell, talk to people about uh, maybe why people might want to attack the United States and imperialism, but I felt like I had to ask questions. I felt like I couldn't be bold in the way we were speaking. It was a moment that was scary in many ways. Um, yeah, yeah. But but um, one of the things that I've gotten from Fred is always a boldness and a courage to speak the truth and to speak with vulnerability, to be self-critical, um, not just with personal friends, but in public audiences with people you don't know. I mean, this real courage and boldness that I appreciate. And uh, another thing I really got get from Fred is this ability to change and grow. And that's what I want to focus on a bit because um, I, I think in, in many ways, in terms of thinking about tactics and being self-critical and thinking about but what needs to be done when the political economy and social context changes, um, I think the one thing that hasn't changed is an urgent desire for revolutionary transformation, right? That, that, that's constant, constant and, a, and a real centering in your life, Fred, of uh, political change. Um, but I think what's intrigued me the most in this last period, in the last few years, is your change from... I don't want to overstate change because I think there's always continuity as Robin was talking about and, and I see that continuity but when you talk about industrialization as being really such a problem and that we need to go back to a subsistence economy I think we're talking about a qualitative change in terms of what we're thinking about what we want for society where we think about the great labor movements always working within industrialization and um, so I want to, it, it's, it's very intriguing to me to think about what our goals are going to be and how we're going to get there, what we're going to build, what we're going to change. And I know you worked in vanguardist um, organizations and you yourself have written about them with criticism uh, in Legacy to Liberation and elsewhere about your work where um, both with, with the kind of, in the 70s, people really struggling so hard with developing ideologically and trying to figure out solutions for society, things that were very admirable, but also the kind of destructiveness that comes with sectarianism, right? Both within organizations and by, by alienating people or refusing to work with people who could otherwise be allies. And I think in this moment, what you're talking about, which resonates for me, is you're saying prefigurative. What I think when I hear prefigurative is when he breezes, brines, discussions of this, which is enacting the values and behaviors that we want to see in a transformed society. And I haven't even asked you what you mean by prefigurative, so I don't know if you're thinking about it in the ways that I'm thinking about it. But if we're doing this, 
then the ways that we treat each other is as important as getting to an end goal of something that we want to do. And this isn't always easy for kind of task-oriented people or people who know what they want to, they want to get at and it's hard to be patient with people. Um, and, and along with this is I think a really a democratizing movement. And I think that, I mean, the idea of democracy obviously isn't new, right? I mean, obviously it's something that people have been doing, but I think with the anti-globalization movement, we're seeing a shift t away from sort of grand planning, you know, central planning towards uh, more affinity groups and working in the local. And part of these ideas also occur because of global changes, right? So that as globalization has allowed new technologies and a disintegration of communities, we need to go back to the local. And the environmental sustainability necessitates connections with local farming and organic farming and other kinds of things. Um, I want to hear more from you about how, what it's going to take right now to build this transformed society that enacts the kinds of values and behaviors that we want to see in this transformed society, how a part of this involves building the commons, which Borrowing from David Bollier, he talks about this as the commons as a collection of all resources and knowledge and things that we collectively own and have a responsibility to pass on to the next generation undiminished, which I think is key, right? Our water resources, our land resources, the internet, our public libraries, our public parks, all these things, the ocean, undiminished I think is what's key here. So how do we get there where we really build the, the, the commons? Like what are our goals? What's our organizing? And I, I really just want to uh, highlight three things and then turn it to you is this idea of healing. You know, not only are you talking about healing your physical body, um, healing the earth, um, healing society from poverty and oppression, but I think very, very deeply are the emotional and psychological wounds that all of us carry within us, things that our parents didn't give us things that um, that that we we longed for or hoped might happen and didn't happen. And I think we all have such deep wounds that we don't talk about. And I think sometimes the movement is guilty for not dealing with. So I think that there's all kinds of healing that needs to happen. And um, the second thing I wanted to mention is what you talk about the impossible. I love that, and sometimes I think we have to do this, right? What seems impossible, because it seems impossible to move this very commercial, electronically induced, hypnotized society to something that you're talking about, connected to nature and going hiking and growing organic foods and all this kind of stuff. And I think part of this is gonna be what you talk about, what you're referring to music as, to improvise in composed situations. And I love that because I think it's gonna be what organizers have to do, right? We're gonna to have to be as creative as possible, but we also are gonna be planned. So anyways, I just wanna hear some more about what these, your new, how you envision change as well as strategies for getting there. Here's what I reject. <laughs> I reject socialist supermarkets. I reject socialist universities. They should be polyversities. I reject socialist television. Um, <clears throat> I reject socialist um, factories. I reject socialist mass production. Those are all oxymorons. Because essentially, the massification of society is a product of industrialism. industrialism. Leads to homo homogeneity, destroys creativity, promotes alienation and estrangement, um, and it destroys integrity and excellence. The Luddites in Western Europe during the early 19th centuries were the first wave of anti-capitalist warriors. Now, Luddites were so dangerous to the system, they've been so vilified that when you want to throw an insult to somebody, you call them a Luddite. The inference being that they're anti-technology. Well, that's a wrong characterization of what the Luddites were. The Luddites were against all forms of technology that were harmful or hurtful to the commons or the commonality, meaning people, 
and or the planet. So to think about what's harmful to, to the commonality requires us to look at everything that we've now assumed is fixed or inevitable in the society. For example, mass production, you know? And this was a gradual kind of thing for me. When I, as an Asian American male in 1989, decided I was never gonna buy any clothes from a store again, and I was gonna design my own clothes, and it would be Afro-Asian concept, because that's my identity. I liberated myself from mass production. I make them either myself, either from scraps, like the pants I'm wearing. Every single scrap on this pants is from a project that I did. These are scraps from previous projects. And when, you know, part of it wears out, then I get another scrap as a patch and put it on. These sandals I wore were my first sandals I ever designed. They're kind of boring because I've become more creative with my sandals, but when you start off, you, you start off simple, you know. Um, as an artist that can travel internationally, I pick up fabric wherever I come. Matef, stand up. This jacket of his came from uh, silk I found in Cambodia, including the buttons. Now, Matef, open up the jacket. I want to show people the, the, the lining. <laughs> That's, I found that in, in, in Palau, Micronesia, it had been sitting in a store for 50 years, that lining, you know, but it, it spoke to me. So um, what I've learned is that really the key to defying the mass imperatives, homogenization, the machine, so to speak, to use just street vocabulary, the, the machine, is for us to become producers ourselves. To fight the machine, the music industry, we knew on an intuitive level, this whole thing we had to produce and control our own music. So I've been able to up that to understand we need to produce and control everything about our existence. Otherwise, we're submitting in the capitalist order to corporations, in the socialist order, to either government or other big institutions. So, um, uh, what's important to understand about the restoration of the commons, what the Luddites understood, uh, and you know, the Trotskyists condemned me because they, they said, you know, Fred, you say you're an aspiring Luddite. Well, those guys were petty bourgeois, meaning, you know, they were craftspeople and uh, small, you know, uh, you know shoemakers and, and this sort of thing, and they were trying to hold back you know, the, 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 forward, the, the, the iron march of progress and, the, and, the, and, you know, development of time and, you know, times moving forward. But here's the thing. What I came to understand about the preservation of tradition, custom, craft, is that two things, on the level of humanity and the level of our soul. And that is, when we submit to the machine and consume what the machine offers to it, we surrender our soul. We surrender any basis for us to have independent assessment of integrity and quality. That's all we have is what's given to us in the catalog, column A, column B, column C. But if you make it yourself, the only limitation you have is your own imagination. You can teach yourself how to do it with very little tools or technology. You know, that jacket of his in terms of material cost about $5. That's about a $5,000 jacket if I wanted to sell it in a capitalist framework. It's a one of a kind. How much did I charge you for that, Matef? Zero. Okay. Now, not everyone can get one of those because it's only one of a kind. Now, other people ask me, jokingly, I want to have that jacket of yours. And I said, well, that's probably, you could probably have it at some point. You may have to alter it because you're, the sister back there, African-American sister, asked me for my jacket. And I said, well, it, it, you know, it may, uh, that might be possible, uh, you know, because I'm giving away a lot because I, I like the idea of the Native American latch. You know, if you haven't used it in three years, then you can just give it away. So every day, every, every time between December 25th and January 1, I do my taxes because I'm still in the machine, and I give away anything I haven't used 
in three years. So come around that time and you might get one of my jackets. <laughs> um, but the Commons is really about the restoration of integrity and excellence and the refusal to accept mediocrity. Because mediocrity is inevitable with mass production. It's inevitable. Think about it. If it's mass produced, more than just being aimed at the lowest common denominator, it's all the same. So it inherently has no excellence to it. Why is that? Everything of the same has no excellence to it because it has no special individuality, or originality to it. That's, we come to understand that as artists. What we don't need is 20 clones, you know, of uh, John Coltrane. What we need are 2,000 versions of unique sounds and ideas, and we'd be all the richer for it. So prefiguration, I never learned, you know, I actually never knew this word before. I used to use the word precursive, you know, or um, uh, uh, prescient. Um, is only because of uh, the movement's engagement, I guess, with, with uh, certain anarchist trends that the word prefigurative formation came up. And I actually prefer the terms base areas or liberated zones or quilombos or palenques. Those were the original prefigurative forms in which escaped slaves built on their own in these little areas, liberated areas where they could, you know, do what they wanted to do, live free. Those, that struggle to live free, even in small little zones, is part of a great tradition of resistance, but also of the imaginative, radical, imagin of the radical imagination. Usually you have to escape to the, most rough, the roughest terrain, you know, where the status quo can't get to or discarded. So you can see this even when the Japanese American in the concentration camps, they made their gardens, you know, they created all different, you know, like the, the Tonka poetry clubs, all these sorts of things was to, to affirm their identity, their humanity in very, very uh, difficult conditions. So I see prefiguration not in contradiction to mass movements or mass struggles, but it's essentially the cellular manifestation of what those mass movements and struggles are about. In a lot of ways, those liberated zones, which can be even your own living room, I mean, the word now has come up in the, in the commercial world called pop-up, like pop-up kitchens and, you know, we're talking about some of us in the arts, we're talking, creating pop-up operas, you know, even in our own living rooms, you know. But I was saying to Robin a couple of days ago, you know, Queen Mother Moore, a domestic worker, street organizer, long time with the Communist Party, then later the Republic of New Africa, before there was Black Studies, started Black Studies in her own living room, what, which people affectionately termed Mount Addis Ababa, you know, with a, with, a, with a library that she built on her own in terms of accumulating materials about African, you know, African history and life and culture. And um, taught people, even though she was not a formal teacher, never had an advanced degree, and schooled a whole generation of revolutionaries, pan-African revolutionaries, out of her living room. So those, to me, are, that's a prefigurative form, you know. Um, the problem we've got, you know, part of our manifest destiny is we've accepted massified institutions, but they're going to collapse. It's like anything large scale like the dinosaur will go extinct much quicker. It's the little guys that will last. And that's just the nature, that's just nature. And in fact, the uh, uh, Manankabao, the matriarchal society of southwestern uh, Sumatra, their, their sacred law, ADAT, A-D-A-T, is based on a simple idea, and that is uh, growth in nature is our teacher. So if we understand how nature grows, we understand that the big things, you know, don't develop, or they develop much slower, you know, and are also much more susceptible 
to extinction, whereas the small creatures adapt much more quickly. So, uh, you know, uh, I think what, what the mention that we, we have yet to, to really seriously develop in any of the left anywhere is this idea of spiritual and philosophical uh, um, uh, spiritual and philosophical liberation. You know, as part of decolonizing both our minds, our body, and also our movement. And I think that uh, we need an exorcism, a cleansing, if you will, a detoxification. Now, does, does that mean discarding our traditions? No, I'm, you know, just before I talked about the importance of traditions. You know, but those traditions, we need to keep our ones that are guerrilla, you know, are not massified, but en enable mobility, quick transformation, and amplify the use of the imagination. Now, here's another thing that, that, that I've come to understand about eco-socialism or what a new socialism has to be about. And it has to be indigenous-centric in, in the sense that the original communists, Native Americans, actually had the answers. And the European invasion destroyed most of the basis for us to actually understand that. Not completely, but destroyed a lot of it. And here are some examples. In Central, South Central and North America, before the European came, you had a multiplicity of different kinds of societies, from small groups that were very nomadic, to large cities with a theocracy, you know, military. Um, but none of these were eco-destructive, except for the impact of massive wars, particularly dealing with the Mayans, the Aztecs, and the Peruvians. Um, Tenochtitlan had a greater population than London, or Madrid, or Rome at that time, you know? In North America, you had about, I mean, there's a lot of debate about it, but in general, the median number is about 75 million inhabitants in North America, okay? In the island of Manhattan, before the arrival of the Europeans, there are about 15 to 25,000 inhabitants. The reason why we don't know much about them is because they left no carbon footprint. Most of the time you use archaeology, you look at the trash that people leave, right? Or the stuff that sticks around for a very, very long time. Well, they lived in such an ecocentric kind of way that there was no trash, you know? And then one generation after the arrival of the Europeans, a dozen bird species go extinct. Two dozen mammal species go extinct. There used to be whales going up and down the East River. You know, up until as late as the early 1800s, okay? Um, you had a society in which there was no prison industrial complex. You know, uh, the greatest crime committed to be committed was rape. And the perpetrator of that rape had to run the gauntlet of their victim's family. And if they lived and survived, that was the justice. But if they didn't, that was the justice. Okay? Um, so in a lot of ways, I feel like Marxism needs to reinvigorate itself with, with indigenous centrism. Look at all those, those, those examples that actually did work, but they didn't happen in Europe. You know? And that's very, very important. Um, are we over time? 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 Okay. Sorry. Because yeah, I want to throw some stuff to you last week. <clears throat>